in November 2017, Strava, a company that makes a health and fitness app, launched a PR stunt. They produced an online digital map that showed information about all the activities and running routes of all their users. Later on, military analysts looked at this map and they realized it was so detailed that it gave away highly sensitive information about the whereabouts of soldiers on active duty. This was because the soldiers, their running routes showed up on the map like circular paths in the middle of the desert because they too had been using the app and uploading their data to the internet. We all produce tons of information every day, loads of it. The more information we keep producing, the more the internet just keeps hoovering and hoovering it all up. We create so much information that it's estimated by the year 2020, we would have accumulated about 40 zettabytes of data. To give an idea of how much data that is, the average laptop holds one terabyte of data. 40 zettabytes would be 40 billion laptops worth of information. I'm Shoti, and I run a digital marketing and analytics business. I love finding stories and data and visualizing them. But as much as I enjoy working with data, on a personal level, I'm concerned about how much of my own data I'm sharing versus how much benefit I'm getting from doing so. I love to exercise, so I got one of these, a fitness tracker. With this device, I can monitor my heart rate, count my footsteps, I can even monitor my sleeping patterns. I wanted to improve my health as much as possible, and I was curious to see if I needed to upload my health data to the internet in order to do that. I decided to investigate this, so today I'm going to talk about what I've learned. I'll give you some examples of good and bad uses of data, and finally, I'll talk about a couple of things I see on the horizon. A lot of the time, when you mention the words big data, this usually gives off negative connotations or is met with suspicion. What exactly is big data? Well, it's pretty much what it sounds like, just loads and loads of data. But recently, it's come to mean much more than that. On the one hand, it means vast amounts of data. On the other hand, it means the intelligence we can get from that data. We get intelligence from that data by using things called computer programs. We take the data, we get a computer program, we put the two together, and we ask the computer program to look for patterns in the data or to predict future outcomes based on data we've collected in the past. I don't like to think of data as a good thing or a bad thing. I like to think of it as a tool. I like to think of it as two sides of the same coin. To start off my investigation, I decided to look into how much of my data I've been sharing. I've got a Google account. I've had one for about 10 years, so I decided to start there. I downloaded all the information Google had on me, and this was relatively straightforward using a tool called Google Takeout. When I did this, to be honest with you, I was staggered by what I discovered. Google had a record of everywhere I'd ever been with my mobile phone. Every time I turned it on, this had been recorded. Google had a record of everything I'd ever searched for and deleted. As yet, I haven't figured out a way how to permanently remove that. <laughs> Google also had an advertising profile on me that contained information about my name, my gender, my interests and hobbies. Google knew what app I'd used, when I'd used it, and for how long I'd been using it. And finally, Google had a complete history of my entire YouTube viewing activity. In total, all this information came up to a whopping six gigabytes of information. Six gigabytes. That's about three million Word documents worth of information. Feeling a bit rattled by this, I decided to look for some more positive uses of data, so I turned to social media. In Tunisia in 2011, there were protests going on all over the country. And these protests were being brutally crushed by the regime, 
and as a result, there was no media coverage. In protest, a man in a village set himself alight. Somebody filmed this, and the footage found its way to Al Jazeera. They then broadcast it across the Middle East. In no time at all, Tunisians were connecting through social media, exchanging stories. They felt more connected. They realized they were all thinking the same thing, and instantly, a revolution began. This was the beginning of what we now know as the Arab Spring. Social media isn't a free service. We pay for it by giving up information about ourselves. And in this instance, this seems like it was a price worth paying. I felt good about this, so I decided to look for other stories like this involving data. I came across one about Haiti in 2010. Now, in that year, the country suffered a devastating earthquake, especially in the city, in the capital, Port-au-Prince. But as it happens, during and after the disaster, there was loads of live tweeting going on. There was so much social media activity going on that outside agencies and teams of data scientists volunteers decided to get together and analyze this information. They were able to figure out the locations as well as the severity of the damage through the tweets. This then allowed them to figure out the most serious life and death situations. They wrapped up all this information and put it into a digital crisis map. This map was used to direct emergency services and rescue operators on the ground. Now, this was the first time in history that outside agencies had more accurate and up-to-date information than emergency services did on the ground during a natural disaster. In these examples, data allowed us all to be more connected. It allowed us to come together and use our collective intelligence to solve our problems. Maybe in the future, we can use this technology to manage our resources better, or even help us fight climate change. Who knows? The possibilities are endless. I carried on my research, and I thought about the healthcare industry. I came across something called wellness programs. Now, a wellness program is where a company tries to reduce the amount of staff sick days it has. Basically, it invites an outside agency to come in and instigate a healthcare program. Sometimes, staff members get to wear fitness gadgets like this, and they get apps to help them monitor and improve their health. Their managers get regular reports on the health of their staff, and some wellness programs have had some successes. But on the flip side to that, even though the data and the reports are anonymized, it's still possible to target and pinpoint individual members of staff. For example, if a lady was ordering the contraceptive pill through the app and she stopped doing that, this would be highlighted in the reports, and it would be possible to figure out that someone was trying to get pregnant or thinking about getting pregnant. Or if someone had a serious illness and they didn't want to share this information, this too could be highlighted in the report. This raises serious privacy issues. Now, do I think this is a good use of data? Personally, I don't think so. I think people's medical records and their employment records should be kept separate at all times. Sticking with the health theme, I came across another story about flu outbreaks in the US. Now, until recently, the way they figured out the next flu outbreak was by centralizing all their health data and analyzing it in the CDC. This is their Center for Disease Control. Now, this process took about two weeks, and researchers wanted to see if they could cut down this time. In fact, researchers wanted to see if they could predict the flu outbreak as it happened in real time. This had the potential to save thousands of lives, so as a result, the Google Flu Trends project was created. The program looked at five years' worth of Google search data, and it focused on search terms relating to the flu, such as flu remedies, colds, have I got the flu, and so on. Analysts found regular patterns between the Google, flu, the Google search data about flu and the CDC's flu outbreak data. Now, researchers were able to predict the next flu outbreak up to 10 days in advance. In the beginning, 
the accuracy of the program was fantastic, about 97%. And this worked great for about two years. Then suddenly, the program's prediction started to fail. The program got so bad, in fact, that Google eventually shut down the website. So why did it fail? It failed because information doesn't exist in isolation. There are always consequences of context. So the problem was, there had been lots of stories in the news about what a severe flu season they had the previous year. This generated more interest in the flu, so more people than usual searched Google for information about the flu, and this confused the computer programs. This is what I mean about when I say data is two sides of the same coin. On the one hand, this information was highly usable, but on the other hand, you do need human judgment to make the best use of it. I started off this journey looking at my fitness tracker and trying to figure out whether I should share my health data online. Now, there are some advantages to doing this and some benefits, such as goal tracking, competitions, and being able to find the most popular running routes in my area. But that being said, there are still questions over who owns that data, you or the company. I wonder if your fitness company goes bust. Or what if you want to switch companies and move your data across? Could you do that? All of this depends on the policies of the company you choose to go with, so you need to read their terms and conditions carefully. A concerning trend with a lot of these companies is that a lot of them are over-collecting data. They're collecting far more data than they have a use for. It seems that they are doing this in the hope that one day in the future they'll be able to make some money out of this. Now, it got me thinking about what a fitness company might do with my data in the future. So for now, I decided not to upload my data online and instead focus on my commitment to improve my health and not on my fancy gadget. I've outlined some of my experiences and talked about some of the things that are possible in the future. And all of this has led me to conclude that we should think of data as a natural resource. It's becoming a bit of a cliche, but many people are saying that data is the new oil. They're probably right. I think we should all think of our personal data like it's our own natural resource. And like any natural resource, we can mine them. And when we mine them, we can create great things from them. But when we do this, sometimes we get byproducts and negative things that we didn't intend to produce, such as privacy issues and security concerns. I really want us all to start talking a lot more about what values we want to see enshrined in our laws to stop people creating and using big data programs badly. I believe if we do this, we can build a future where big data, artificial intelligence, where these things work for me, work for you, all of us, and the greater good. It's in our hands. Thank you.